Welcome back to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry. Here's your host, Brother Robert Johnson. This is episode 393. Welcome back. So we're back from the short episode we had last week. I hope you guys all enjoyed the 16 minutes of updates regarding Masonic Con 2019 out there in Attleboro. I've got a great show for you this week. I've got a paper that was submitted by a listener, as well as a new segment from illustrious brother Stephen L. Harrison on the Masonic Minute. And we'll wrap it up with the piece that I wrote last Monday in conjunction with the release of the podcast. So before we jump right in, I just want to ask everybody to head on over to WCYPodcast.com and click on the more And when you do that, you're going to see a few things. One of them is, of course, where to listen. Through that link, you can see the different platforms you can listen to the show on. If you want to switch it up, you'll find Bankers Best. So if you go to Bankers Best, click on that link, and then you click through those uh, links to the products. Use the promo code BBWCY357. If you're into beard oils, Brother Levi Banker has you covered. He's got some amazing stuff. In addition, there is a link there to get on it. That is on it labs exclusive products like Alpha Brain, Hemp Force Protein, some wonderful supplements out there that are all natural. They're vegan, no dyes on the capsules, all this really great stuff. And Alpha Brain in particular is probably my favorite product. We also have the limited edition shop. If you go there, you can pick up a producer's pin. Those are $10 plus shipping. It's a brand new design. We went with like a flat metallic look. Uh, it's We still maintained the color red on the triangle. I'm told that the pin looks great on a motorcycle jacket. So perhaps your widow's son or just a rider because of the flat metal look. I guess it goes along pretty well with that motif. But uh, our new contemporary pin is there. Check it out. Again, $10 plus shipping. All the money that comes in from this stuff goes right into producing this program we've also got the mason's lady car decal available for you for just five dollars plus shipping and of course it's business time adapting a corporate path for freemasonry i'll autograph the book i'll set it all up and ship it out to you all packaged up by me for you a little thank you card everything comes with it and I hope you guys will uh, consider doing any any of those things in order to help out this program of course there is also Intellectual Linear Progression, which is a fantastic program. If you've ever wanted to read books and needed somebody to go through it with you like a book club, but intellectual books like The Philosophies, right? So there's a great program put on by Brother Scott Hambrick at Intellectual Linear Progression. Now they just started the new season, so you're going to have to wait a few weeks before you can jump on and get involved in the program. But if you want to do it, Go to WCYPodcast.com, click on the link on the left-hand side of the screen, and use the promo code WCY when you check out. Certainly not least, our last option, which is keeping the lights on. So you can make a one-time donation to the show, or you can become a monthly contributor for just $2 a month, a fellow for 5 or a producer level at $10 a month. What that allows us to do is, of course, not worry about when our website renews, not worry about when our servers charge us every month to host the podcast so that all the episodes are always available for all of you. It allows us to produce the artwork that we need for the show. It allows us to gain access to more resources for the show. In short, it really, really helps us out. So, if you are already doing one of those things, thank you so very much. We cannot do this without you, and you know it because your name appears on our donor's wall. So thanks again, everybody. Let's get into this week's first piece. O Brother, Where Art Thou? By Brother Jeremiah Swartzel. I left the lodge on a chilly Saturday in April 2018. A new Master Mason, blue ritual book in tow, with a brand new ring given to me by my father-in-law, and now brother, who flew in from Georgia to see me raised to the sublime degree of a Master Mason. It felt great to have my wife and family so proud of me upon returning home, an extra bonus to the occasion. After the initial excitement wore off, I was left to figure it all out. What was different in my life? I still had the same busy work schedule. 
I still maintain a marriage to my wife of 11 years and a home to upkeep. I had walked out of the lodge, a master mason upright as a plum, but still dealing with those pesky vices nagging at me on a daily basis. Masonry makes good men better, or so I was told. But how was the question on my mind? Through the degrees, we all learn about the working tools of a mason and how they apply to moral principles. During the ritual in my own experience, I can safely say that I retained about 10% of what was being said to me by the instructive voices. It was a whirlwind of sorts, but even in the midst of the chaos, it impressed upon me some important lessons. One was that every man there was my brother, and everyone who's a world away were also my brother. Another was that I should be eager to understand what had just happened in that lodge on a Saturday morning. I began to read the ritual of the degrees, trying to picture in my mind the event and how it related to the words on the page. Admittedly, it did not fully make sense to me. Not until I saw the degrees for myself and took part in bringing other good men into our fraternity. But surely the act of taking three degrees of obligations to a fraternity isn't what makes a man a better version of himself. That's not it, is it? No. It's the practice of masonry that makes men better. A year in, joining the officer line as a steward, I began to see a trend of low participation as I eagerly volunteered for as many things as I was capable, with participation generally limited to the officers. I visited a few lodges during the year and even chatted with brothers in Florida over the summer at a somber Masonic funeral for my grandfather, where they gave me the honor of standing in as chaplain. As you can imagine, a small town on the panhandle might have a surplus of older gentlemen and a few younger men to choose from. Their average member age was 67 years old. The consensus was all the same. Not enough men are showing up to lodge, and the ones that are initiated are rarely ever heard from again after they take their third degree. To be fair, family always comes first and work follows this closely, but why is it that our brothers are not able to find an evening a month to attend lodge with their brothers? Maybe it's not entirely their fault. Maybe some of the fault lies within the dynamic of the lodge. We've all heard the saying, what you get from masonry is a result of what you put into it, which every new brother is still blinded by the light and seeing green spots everywhere, nods in affirmation to the chorus of other voices, their agreement at the dinner table. This is a promise of sorts, that if you put in the effort to learn the ritual and apply its lessons to your life, you will be made a better man for it and the opportunities to explore the mysteries is infinite and unique to each individual traveler. This is how I interpreted it, at least. But it is tinged with another meaning that voices itself as a complaint once you've attended a year of business meetings. Quote, I don't understand why anybody shows up to meetings. Nobody helps with planning and doing the work. Masonry is what you put into it. End quote. This isn't a phenomena belonging to my lodge alone where fellow brothers and I scratch our heads trying to figure out how to get more brothers showing up. In listening to and reading Masonic commentary from around the country, I can confidently say it's a huge problem everywhere. Maybe it always has been a problem, not just in the era of Netflix and chill, binge-watching a favorite show. I firmly believe that no Mason attends Lodge to hear the minutes read at the end of a two-hour business meeting, though the recording of proceedings is indeed a vital part of the Lodge. Neither does he show up to raise his hand to vote for another $100 payment to the latest charity to send a request. Granted, many of these charities are worthy and do good work, and there is certainly a place for this type of charity. I'm not even close to saying this shouldn't be a part of our charity outreach. But is it possible that a brother who chooses month after month to stay away on lodge night is unfulfilled when it comes to serving his community, or even his own distressed brothers? Did he expect something else to be in place in that lodge when he joined, but instead found out that the lodge only sends sums of money out instead of brothers to do the work of building up the community or aid a brother with the most valuable asset we have? That thing we all hold dear and have so little to spare. That finite thing called time. He might say to himself, they don't need me there, as he finds causes away from the lodge to fulfill his desire to give back. 
Charity should begin on the level and part upon the square. A mason who stays home may also do so because there is not enough fellowship or opportunities to connect. We see our brothers show up to hot events each year, which could be the only time we have the pleasure to connect with them. Maybe if we chose to have more purely fellowship events at Lodge and even outside of the Lodge, we would see a rise in attendance and participation. There are Lodges out there that do this and have great success getting their members engaged. Here's another thought. Maybe a cause of poor attendance is low wages. Please don't misunderstand me. Not monetary or material wages. The wage I'm speaking of is education. The discussion and instruction that enriches him and even challenges him to continue his work on that rough ashlar that becomes a part of that heavenly temple. This very attribute of masonry is what sets it apart from the other dues-paying fraternities and dinner clubs around the world. So why has it been left to the appended bodies to educate a mason? Education does not have to be an esoteric discussion of a Manly P. Hall book, nor does it have to involve the symbols or mysteries. Certainly, I believe this needs its place in the lodge room, but couldn't educational material include a discussion about things in the community that need our help and support? Could we gain perspective from someone of a totally different background or belief that could spark a change in us for the better? Is it possible to talk about current issues without slipping into political or religious division? Maybe this is an area where, during the discussion, the worshipful master stands ready with mortar and trowel to make sure the living stones in the midst of growth and improvement are cemented together with brotherly love. I believe wholeheartedly that this is necessary to making masonry relevant in the lives of our brothers as well as our respective communities. A culture of growth through education is paramount. Some will say that the Blue Lodge exists to make more Masons. This is true, but it is doubly true that the Blue Lodge exists to make those Masons into better men. We need to ask the questions in Lodge like, what type of Lodge do we belong to? The Holy Bible states that without vision, the people perish. If we don't agree on the direction the Lodge is heading, then how can a long-lost brother find his way to fit in? The things that caused him to stay home on lodge night must be identified and changed, and a vision for the lodge must be formed and then implemented. As you may have guessed by this point, that this is not a blatant outcry to the missing brother, as the title may have suggested. It is a call for action toward the lodges in our own jurisdictions. Even still, it is fitting that I should close with a word to that long-lost brother. Brother, you are badly needed at lodge not forgiving of your time or your dues. It is you that we need. And if you read this and nodded in agreement to the cause of your absence or even found them all to miss the mark, I would like to challenge you here and now. Go to the lodge and at the very next stated meeting, stand up and make known what kind of lodge experience you want. Some may resist the change, but change is inevitable. It is up to everyone with an interest to work toward making the Lodge into what they desire it to be. And this was published on the Valley of Shadows website, thevalleyofshadows.wordpress.com. I'll have a link back to this article in the show notes. I want to thank the brother for sending this to me and bringing it to my attention. I think he has a fairly common experience and some fairly common solutions that, that feel like they would work. If only we'd try them. Now, of course, there are lodges that do try them and have turned around, but there are a lot that don't. And it's not always on our brother who doesn't come back. Sometimes the guy who doesn't come back is the guy who was running the show for ever. The young guy you raised 10 years ago and stopped going. Yeah, well, he got burnt out. Nobody else was doing anything and the lodge wasn't doing much. It just wasn't fulfilling, right? So we have to change that. But those Masons need to go to Lodge and try to work hard to change things. And if they don't, you gotta vote with your feet. All right, next up is this week's special Masonic Minute with illustrious brother Stephen L. Harris. Let's check it out. In September 1914, the Kansas City Scottish Rite offered an energetic young Mason a job as administrator of the newly formed Mason's Relief Committee. A restaurant owner, the young brother sold his business and went to work for the Masons. Frank 
Sherman Land didn't realize it, but at the age of 24, his destiny was now laid out before him. In the years that followed, Land built the program into one of the premier relief organizations in Kansas City, helping secure hundreds of jobs for the unemployed and distributing food and clothing to the needy. The organization grew and in time, Land needed assistance, so he hired 17-year-old Louis Lauer to help him during evenings and weekends. Lewis had just lost his father. Land understood how much Lewis missed his father due to his separation from his own dad as a youth. Land was so impressed with young Lewis that in February 1919, he suggested forming a club at the Scottish Rite Temple in Kansas City for Lewis and some of his friends. The following week, Lewis and his friends met there for the first time. Over the next couple of months, Land and Lauer met with a core group of eight additional boys. Others joined and the little club began to flourish. They named this new organization after the last Grand Master of the Knights Templar, who, rather than betray his god, defied the Pope and the King of France and was burned at the stake. Thus was born the Order of de Molay, which today, in 2019 celebrates 100 successful years of helping turn boys into men. My father, my brother, and I are among the thousands who have benefited from its precepts. Also in that group are Frank Borman, Walt Disney, John Steinbeck, Fran Tarkenton, John Wayne, and a host of others you would immediately recognize as leaders and role models. To be sure, my experience as a Malay was somewhat different than boys who are members today. Like the Masons, the organization has suffered a decline in membership over the years. We had more members and more participation than typically found in chapters today. In fact, my chapter had so many members, officers' terms were limited to six months, so to give boys a chance to advance. As Master Counselor, I had a full line of officers, 22 in all. I had the standard insecurities of any geeky high school student. My extracurricular activities were church, Boy Scouts, and Malay. Of all those, not discounting the importance of the others, it was Malay that best taught me I could be a leader. During my term, we had a major event master, senior, and junior counselors coming from all over the state for a counselor's night. And there I was, a 17-year-old kid standing in the East with a chapter packed with statewide Demolay and Masonic leaders. It was a big deal, and I was just a little too young and naive to recognize the support I had from the chapter advisors who were really the ones who put it together. That's okay. Events like that gave me the confidence to be a leader, not a follower. And that is exactly what those advisors wanted. I did not join the Freemasons immediately after being a DMLA. I went off to college, never thought much about the Masons. When my father became a 50-year member, he asked me to attend the ceremony and present his jewel. As I walked into that lodge room, my first time in about 25 years, the memories of my Demolay experiences flooded back to me. Everything was as I remembered. It was all familiar, comfortable, and even inspiring. Right then and there, I decided I wanted to join, and I can say without hesitation, if I had not been a Demolay, I would not be a Freemason today. It is my sincere hope and prayer that today's smaller groups of Demolay get as much out of the organization as I did, and from what I've seen of many of them, they do. A recent survey showed about 9% of all Freemasons are former Demolays. You could say that's not a high percentage. 
I prefer to look at it another way. You could also say fully 9% of our membership comes from DMLA and in an era of falling membership, any group that provides that percentage of our members is significant. Whatever the case, it wouldn't surprise me if many of those DMLAs who become Masons will also be among our leaders. Happy 100th birthday, DMLA. May you flourish and have many more. For the Whence Came You podcast, this is Steve Harrison with the Masonic Minute. All right, our thanks goes out to illustrious Brother Harrison and his wonderful piece there on the DMLA. If you like Brother Steve's writing and the way he talks, shoot him an email. Let him know. His email's right there on the Midnight Freemasons website. You can click that and shoot him an email. Let him know what you're thinking about. Maybe you've got some cool stories to tell. If you want to reach out to Steve and maybe ask for his advice on how to do things, or if you're curious, of course I can help you out as well. But just keep that in mind. And uh, if you like Brother Steve's writing and his reading, please feel free to check out his books. You can go to WCYpodcast.com, click on the More button, and then click on the WCY Bookstore. And in there is a fairly decent comprehensive list of the authors that we've had on the show, as well as their text works that they've produced. Uh, I have two favorites that Steve's written. One is Tales from the Craft. The other is the Oak Island and Freemasonry. Both are wonderful. I would highly recommend them. And uh, check those out. Next up, I have a press release. That's right a press release. And here we go. For immediate release, South Pasadena Masonic Lodge number 290F and AM Masonic Con Weekend arrives in California. Get your rest now. For the first time in our state's Masonic history, a weekend Masonic conference centered around Masonic themes, conspiracies, and pop culture will take center stage this July. April 26th, 2019, South Pasadena, California. The Masons of South Pasadena Masonic Lodge number 290 F&AM are pleased to announce the first Masonic Con weekend in the United States. While a couple of jurisdictions in Illinois, Texas, and Massachusetts have had their day of one-day conferences, California will be the first state to attempt to make history by having a weekend-long educational conference open to both Masons and the public on July 12th through the 14th, 2019. This weekend, long, fully immersive Masonic conference will bring together over half a dozen notable Masonic scholars who will be speaking on various topics geared to enlighten the listener on the far-reaching impact Freemasonry has and continues to have in our society. Our keynote speaker this year will be Worshipful Brother Arturo de Hoyos, 33rd Degree. What will make this event even more unique will be the opportunity to participate in a pop culture festive board on the very first night. We will also have four film screenings during the weekend. Fight Club, Mysteries of the Knights Templar, Sacred Steel TV Show, and Illuminated, The History of the Illuminati. A couple of these shows have not yet been shown publicly, making this event all the more special. Some screenings will have at least one filmmaker partake in the Q&A, after the respective showing. Website and ticket sales open May 1st. There will be two ticket options, general admission, 125, and executive pass, 165. Check our website, www.masoniccon.com. That's M-A-S-O-N-I-C-C-O-N dot C-O-M for ticket information. This event will have limited capacity, We strongly encourage you to purchase your tickets early. No tickets will be sold at the door. If you would like to be a vendor, please contact our secretary for further details. Join us this summer, July 12th through 14th, as we make history when Masonic Con arrives in California. About South Pasadena Masonic Lodge number 290. South Pasadena Masonic Lodge was chartered by the Grand Lodge of California in 1888, the same year the city was born. Our Lodge has been serving the community and its surrounding cities for the past 131 years. The building we currently occupy, which we built in 1930, is our fourth home. Mayors, doctors, actors, scientists, mechanics, police chiefs, lawyers, school administrators, filmmakers, engineers, and the like have been raised in our Lodge, all helping build its eclectic identity that we admire and cherish. About the Masons of California. 
Freemasonry, the world's first and largest fraternal organization, is based on the belief that man who strives to improve himself can thereby improve his community and our society at large. The Masons of California have more than 60,000 members in over 340 lodges located throughout the state. The California Masonic Foundation is committed to making a profound difference for the community and touches the lives of thousands of Californians each year. If you have further questions, please contact us at the number or email below. Mimo Akari, Past Master, Lodge Secretary. You can contact him at niftymimo at yahoo.com. Visit their website at www.southpasadena290.org and make sure you visit the website, www.masoniccon.com. Now, it's really exciting, guys. They've got a lot of great speakers. They are allowing me to go and do a single talk. I think I'm also going to be moderating some of the panel discussions. Think San Diego Comic-Con, because that's really what it feels like to me when I read everything and I've been talking to Dago through this process. It's really exciting. The website went live just a few days ago. Maybe you've already got tickets. Maybe you haven't. I highly recommend it. It's going to be awesome. A multi-day event. What? I know. It's so crazy and so cool, but I can't wait to get out there and check it out. All right. Next is a piece that I wrote last week for the Midnight Freemasons, and I'd like to read that for you now. A Masonic Revolution, Education, and the Front Lines of a War to Save Freemasonry. By Midnight Freemason contributor, Robert H. Johnson. There I was leveling out at 30,000 and snapping into some Biscoff cookies. Why? Because it was happening again, Masonic Con. This marks the fourth year in a row that the event has been going on, put on by an extraordinary group of Masons in Attleboro, Massachusetts. This year was another home run. Three years ago, I first went to this conference. I delivered a talk on Colonial America and Freemasonry to a packed room of Masons, their ladies, and the profane. It was unreal. The technology was worked out, the schedule of speakers was amazing, and the vendors. Let's just say I spent a lot of money. Last year was even bigger. It felt like San Diego Comic-Con, but, you know, for Freemasons. I hosted a discussion on Star Wars and Freemasonry with my good friend and occasional guest contributor here, Right Worshipful Brother Michael Jarzebeck. Again, what an incredible time. Both years, we marked with special tours of historical sites, in and around the New England area by the mastermind of Masonicon, Brian Simmons, a Masonic titan in his own right. I spent time with men who inspire me, who I love and who bring out the best of me. Of course, there are brothers that I know that couldn't make the conference, and I missed them. Arriving at Logan International Airport in Boston an hour late due to weather, I met up with Brother Joe Martinez and we drove into Attleboro together. We caught up on news of our families, our jobs, our gripes, and our joys. You know how it goes with a brother in the car. The radio never comes on. Once in town, we met up with Mike Hambrick and drove to a great restaurant and pub for some long-awaited beer and food. Yeah, we ate too much. Well, I did anyway. This year was marked with some differences. Notably, I missed my good friend and brother, Alex Powers. You might know him from his podcast, Historical Light, or maybe you're just a participant in the Facebook group of the same name. Alex couldn't be with us for personal reasons this year, and that's all I'll say. But he was missed. I also missed one of my muses, Dago Rodriguez of Fraternal Review. That aside, this weekend was amazing, yet again. A full lineup of speakers is available, and you can check that out on their website. One of the presentations I was extremely excited about was one on Tombstone Lodge. You might remember something I did about a fictitious lodge of gold on an old radio program called Masonic Radio Theater. Well, Chris Douglas did a great job on this particular presentation. I learned a lot. I also learned that Chris is an astounding creator as well. He made these great cufflinks in this pin that I acquired. They're made out of bullet casings. As he said to me, you're wearing real history as I put the lapel pin on my jacket. And he was right, I really was. And damn, it looked nice too. I met Travis Simpkins, another contributor to our blog, for the very first time in person. He was, as I imagined, a perfect gentleman and a model mason. He brought along his wife, who also is a very talented artist. I had waited a long time to meet them, and I finally had. Along with meeting them, I was able to really connect with several readers of this blog and listeners to the podcast, both WCY and TMR. To connect with the listeners is an opportunity I have long sought. 
All right, I admit that was a bad joke, but seriously, it means so much to talk, to share, and to listen to what you all think, not just about what I produce, but the things that are happening in the lodges around the country, in your lodges. It's crucial to understanding and perpetuating Masonic education, the reason for the craft. Speaking of education, I finally sat in the same room as Nicholas Lane of Castle Island Virtual Lodge, out of Manitoba. Yep, he's a real guy. Not just a computer simulation, as I had once suspected. The brothers from Canada were so gracious, and I've learned so much from attending the lodge they maintain. In fact, look for some exciting news coming very soon related to, uh, well, you just have to wait. Masonic Con at Ezekiel Bates Lodge somewhat kicks off the season for Masonic Education Conferences. Next weekend is the Midwest Conference on Masonic Education. That's where I am right now, or I just got back from if you're listening to this on Sunday night or Monday morning. After this, in June, is the inaugural Mid-Atlantic Esotericon, followed by the first-ever Pasadena Masonicon on the West Coast, which is then followed up by Camp Masonry. Can you believe all these opportunities for education and fellowship? I won't be missing any of it. I'll be at all of them. Why? Because like all of you, I love Masonic education. This year was the first time I attended Masonicon in Attleboro, and I wasn't a speaker. This made it a much different experience. As I stated, I was able to really connect with my brothers. I spent the majority of my days with the lads from the Masonic Roundtable and the architect of Esotericon, Joe Martinez. So many people made this weekend special, talking with friends I had not seen in a year, literally. Ryan Flynn, Mike Jarzebek, Nicholas Harvey, Aaron Chauncey, Chris Hodap, and more. Chris Hodap actually wasn't scheduled to speak, but he pinched hit due to a speaker not being present. He had a key gem that I took away from his talk, and I wanted to share it with you. Paraphrasing, he said, Stop telling men that they get out of Freemasonry what they put into it. He then flipped the script as JFK once did. Chris continued, You will get out of your members what you invest in them. I saw pencils taken to paper, scribbling this down, trying not to miss the next thing he'd say. It was so simple, yet this was maybe kind of new. The weekend really culminated for me and I'm sure many others at the festive board. The MC Brian Simmons kicked it off with a toast and then asked the ladies present to talk about Freemasonry. Those ladies, I can't tell you how amazing they were. It made me think about my own wife, who many of you know, and how supportive she is with everything in my life. I wished she had been there, and there's no way she's getting out of going next year. When I began to write this up, my goal was to give a review of Masonicon 2019, and that's probably not what we have here, though. More of my reminiscing of the days I was there. There were many things I witnessed and heard this past weekend that I will inevitably write about. Here in this article, there are a few I wanted to mention up front. At the end of the day, I asked Brother Carlos Hernandez of Ascended Masters if he needed any help with packing up. And while we chatted, a brother approached me and was buying a ring from Brother Carlos. This brother was looking at the same ring I was looking at. He asked Carlos if he had the ring in a size 10, which coincidentally was the same size ring I wore. When Carlos said he did have one, I asked him to get one out for me too. I'd like to buy one. At this, the brother who had approached to buy the ring expressed to me his gratitude for this podcast, and that although he'd not been able to contribute to producing the show or donate, he wanted to buy this ring for me. I was completely taken aback. I didn't know what to say. It was a moment in which I felt this overwhelming gratitude, and I tried to explain that this wasn't necessary. This brother would have none of it. He paid for the rings. We both put them on and shook hands. It's kind of a thing now. The ring is more than a neat design. It means something else. For me, it's representative of this brother and the mutual gratitude that we both felt. It's apropos that the ring itself is an Ouroboros. I'll say it again, brother. Thank you. Next was when the adept Ben Wallace told us about the importance of two grown-ass men being able to say, I love you, to one another. It was a powerful moment that everybody in the room felt, and he was right. It's something that is important. So do that. Next time you're at Lodge, tell a brother, I love you. Next was a moment in which Brother David Riley talked about what Freemasonry had done for him, accepted who he was, and all that came with it. It was so powerful and so important. I asked that brother to do his best in retelling it here on the WCY podcast. It'll be on eventually. Finally, as the night wrapped up, the festive board was over and the lodge was nearly empty. I got to connect with Carlos Hernandez a little more. 
and I have to say I found a man so dedicated to the craft and to his art that it inspired me. To all my brothers of Ezekiel Bates, that's right, I'm a member there, I want to thank you for putting on this event again. It's the granddaddy of Masonic conferences. Yes, there are conferences put on by grand jurisdictions and all that, but those are full of pomp, endless introductions, and so many back-scratching lackeys. Well, you get it. This was a local lodge, without Grand Lodge support, putting on an event that dwarfed anything that had been done before in their area. I believe in the mission so much I pluraled up there. While I can't attend but one meeting a year, the dues I pay is a small way I can vote with my dollars. It's what I feel is important. But also, many men have also done the same. Ezekiel Bates boasts a membership of several out-of-state members for this very reason. While at the airport reminiscing about the past few days, the emotions riding high and trying to make sense of the reality that we'd all have to go back home to our lodges, our stale meetings of no education, no real brotherhood, and sad past master luncheons that always have endless soda, tea, and coffee, I received a text from Nicholas Harvey. He mentioned something similar. How do we bring this home? How can we do it? Perhaps this is one small way to write about it, to tell others, to evangelize it. While walking across the street in Cambridge, Mass, on the way to see North Bridge, there's a quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson etched into the walkway. The thunderbolt fell on an inch of ground, but the light of it fills the horizon. I think that quote is one to contemplate. It's so very relevant in our situation. It just might be a revolution. This year's Masonic Con was a success. Robert Johnson, Managing Editor. All right, that's it for this week. I hope you all enjoyed. Again, if you're listening to this, I probably just got home this day or a little later on, a little earlier in the day, from the Midwest Conference on Masonic Education. I'll have a full report for you next week, complete with all of the news and the rundown of the speakers. So that's it, guys. I hope you all loved the show this week. Don't stop pushing Masonic education. Again, if you'd like to support this program, check out wcypodcast.com and consider any of the options available. We really appreciate it. Also, if you're listening to this on YouTube, please subscribe, tell your friends, share the videos, all of that, because we need to gain a subscriber base so that we get access to some additional YouTube tools. So thank you very much, everybody. We'll talk to you all next week. And until then, stay on the level. For Whence Came You, I'm Robert Johnson. You've been listening to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry with your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Be sure to join us for our next edition. 